when work is meaningful, we'll assume the responsibility for it. When we are engaging in activity that fills our cup, we can work a whole lot more than if it's draining our cup. You're listening to the Building a Coaching Culture podcast. If you need to compete and win in the 21st century labor market as an employer of choice, this podcast is for you. Each week, we share leadership development, coaching, and culture development insights from leading experts who are developing world-class cultures in their own organizations. And now, here's your host, J.R. Flatter. Welcome back, everybody. I'm J.R. Flatter, and this is our podcast, Building a Coaching Culture. As always, I'm here with my co-host, Lucas. Hello. How you doing, Lucas? Getting ready for Thanksgiving? Yeah, I just came from a turkey trot at my son's school. <laughs> <laughs> and our distinguished guest today is Jerry St. Pierre. Jerry, I'm going to allow you to introduce yourself because you could do that much better than I could ever do. But I'm just going to remind our viewers um, who it is we're talking to, who it is we're speaking to, and, and why we're all here. So our intended target for this podcast is viewers and listeners who are leading complex organizations. Could be government, could be for-profit, could be nonprofit, who need to attract and retain the world's top talent. Here we are entering the 24th year soon of the 21st century in a hyper-competitive labor market. It's global, it's virtual, it's younger generations with different expectations of organizations, different expectations of leadership, all with the goal of driving down recruiting costs, increasing retention, ultimately becoming an employer of choice. And we really believe in this, Jerry, where uh, the dialogue hopefully will go over the, the time together while we're here, and that is to build that coaching culture that creates that coaching style of leadership, which attracts and retains those 21st century employees. So that's why we're here. I'm going to turn the floor over to you, Jerry, let you brag about yourself a little bit. I mean that sincerely. This is not a time to be humble. I know you're doing some amazing things, both in your Air Force career as a chaplain, but also the nonprofits that you lead. So the floor is yours, sir. Hey, thank you, JR, Lucas, and uh, everybody else for joining in today. So a little bit about me. I'm Jerry St. Pierre. First and foremost, I'm a husband of 20 years now. We just celebrate our 20 years of marriage. So I'm excited about that. Just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Cheers for Jerry. I made it. Cheers for my wife. She made it. Three kids, teenagers now. And so pray for me. No, I love it. I've got a great family. I'm active duty Air Force. I'm an Air Force officer and chaplain. And so I get the great privilege of serving our nation's warriors and caring for their souls and and their families and helping them to uh, thrive in life, both inside the Air Force and outside the Air Force. Um, also a, a seasoned real estate investor. I've been investing in real estate for over 20 years now, and uh, I own a property management company in Georgia that manages my portfolio. And so that's going very well. If you track in the real estate market, we've been very blessed lately. But perhaps what I'm most uh, excited about right now is the St. Pierre Alliance. Just a little backdrop on that. Last year around July, I was talking with my wife about how we could help college kids because I was that college kid that was uh, come from a very impoverished background, very, very violent background, not healthy at all. And, And I made it through college and people helped me financially. They would drop money to help me. And I'm very grateful for that. And I've always wanted to give back. So I said, well, why don't we, you know, set aside a couple of thousand dollars this year and and give back? And uh, well, I ended up telling some friends about it and those I've done business with. And they said, cool, I'm in too. And so we launched the St. Pierre Alliance in 2022, earlier this year. And uh, if I can say I'm thankful for Flatter Inc. to be a part of the alliance. And we're almost at $10,000 of scholarships this year. We've got performance coaches that we, we partner with students who are in college or on their way to college. They've got adversity that they've overcome and they're wanting to break free and create a new life. And so part of that scholarship is they get performance coaches that serve them throughout the year that they're in the Alliance. And our intent is to stay with them all four years of college and uh, help them fund school, but not just get through college financially 
but to capitalize what's inside of them, to help pull out that potential that's inside of them. And that's what we're doing with our coaches. And so that's the St. Pierre Alliance in a nutshell. And uh, that's a little bit about Jerry St. Pierre. Give us the website where we can go find out more information if we're interested in. Great. You can go to www.thestpierrealliance.com. And St. Pierre is S-T-P-I-E-R-R-E. There's no periods, no spaces, just S-T-P-I-E-R-R-E, alliance.com. And uh, you can find us there and just look around and just click, get involved, press the button and off you go and just contact me. Or you can go to jerrystpierre.com and just click contact Jerry on that page and reach me that way. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, we're honored to be a part of that. It's great stuff that you're doing. So we might go back and forth between you and your professional life and your background and and also the volunteer work that you're doing, the foundation that you've set up. So anywhere that you feel you want to take that conversation. So Lucas and I usually bounce back and forth. I'll ask a question, maybe a follow-up. He'll ask a question. Don't feel constrained by any of the above. We want the conversation to go where you think it would be most valuable. I think I hear a hint of an accent in the back of your voice. Where, where is that coming from? I'm born and raised in New Orleans. So I got that Cajun coming out. Give me some good cooking. It comes out even thicker. It's just the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get excited, you know. It gets thicker and thicker with the as the minutes go by, you know. <laughs> it's starting to come out now. I hear it. Now you got me paying attention to it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> So you talked a little bit about adversity in your childhood. Talk to us about how you survived and broke out. You know, as I've remedied the hurt and pain, because we have to go on a journey if we're going to heal. We all go through hurt. That's not uncommon to the nature of mankind or the story of life. But it's what we do with that, the hurt, that will determine the course of our life in time, right? And I like to think about the healing of the soul, doing the work necessary to let the natural bent of who we are become our expression and not the bent out of shapeness that life can sometimes put upon us, right? And so I took a journey that I was in many ways unaware of. You know the song, um, all this time I was finding myself and I didn't know I was lost. So wake me up when, you know that one, right? Well, I think about that. Oftentimes we're lost and don't even know it. And we're finding ourselves and didn't even know we were lost. And I think it's a journey, that song really does capture so well the journey of life, if we'll listen to it. At least that phrase really drives it home, you know. And so I went on a journey of, of spiritual formation, of healing the soul. And it was in my 30s where I was, I think, 35, 36 years old. I was 30, 36. And it was in January. I was living in Massachusetts at the time. And uh, just out of nowhere, I was getting ready for work one morning and just I busted out with one of those tears, you know, those that just started weeping. And it was one of those, you know, you, you ever had like that cleansing cry? You know what I'm talking about? That just kind of you feel like, man, that needed to get out. That was that. And I said to myself, I said out loud, I said, why did nobody protect me? And all that was in my story as I was on the journey of healing, I finally was at a place where it could come out without destroying me, the breakdown, right? The emotional breakdown. And so I ended up in the next few years kind of closing the wound down to where it can heal. And it was a journey of dealing with the pain and the hurt, of internalizing truth and wisdom, of expanding my mindset and my heart set so that I could thrive in life. And so as I launched the Alliance, I said, what, what was the thing that got me to where I am? Well, people helped out financially, so we're going to help out financially. But there was more. There was people who came alongside me to help me figure out me and life. And they loved me in spite of my brokenness. And they told me truth and gave me wisdom. And I said, I'm going to take that. I'm going to take that. And I internalized it, you know, just, and what I found it was doing was it was helping me get unbent out of shape is the way I like to put it. And so here I am at the ripe young age of 42. And the question now is how do I give my unbent out of shapeness, my natural bent to the world? Well, 
And that's why the alliance is a thing. That's why I'm a husband and father. It's why I have my company in Georgia. It's why I'm a chaplain. It's why I'm a performance coach in the military and outside of the military. It's all in that vein of, okay, let me give to the world now a healed version of me because there's an old saying, hurt people hurt people, right? But there's also the healed people heal people. And as we go on that journey of healing, we become the catalyst for other people's healing. And that's such a beautiful place to be. And so I try to live there as much as I can in spite of my brokenness, because I don't get it perfect, but I have that value to give. And so I try to give it away as much as I can. So that's a little bit of that journey of adversity to healing. So a lot of times um, we talk about, you know, how valuable being vulnerable in a coaching style of leadership is. Do you think um, some people that kind of have that background of adversity, they can kind of build up some mental walls, some emotional barriers that keep them from being truly vulnerable like that? It depends on if they've healed their wounds or not. We can only take people as far as we are. So I know in your cohort, when you came through the training, there was a large number of chaplains such as yourself. And a lot of the questions we get in our training, and even in, in these podcasts, is you know, where are those lines and how do you keep them clear between what you do as a chaplain or what someone might even do as a counselor or a therapist, and then your coaching? So talk to us how you work through that, please. Well, I think there's significant overlap between coaching and ministry because you're dealing with the heart of a person. And so is there a blurry line? I would say the line would be drawn when it comes to going into spiritual healing from spiritual wounds in your life. That might be stepping more into the chaplain side of of things, but leading the heart of a person or helping the person to lead themselves is a journey that is what the coach does, right? We want to help that person discover themselves at a deeper way, which is a spiritual journey of itself. But I would say that the difference is when we start getting into spiritual wounds of life or the spiritual formation, if they want to go there, I'm uniquely equipped, I would say, to help them go there. But the goal is for them to be self-empowered and to not take that power from them. But I would say that the line really has to fall in the, the realm of when we're getting into the spiritual formation side of things, allowing them to take that vector uh, on their own, which is what I do as a chaplain anyway, because I'm trying not to put my personal belief system on someone else. It's unless I'm invited to do so, well, what would you do is kind of how that usually come across. What would you do? And I would say, okay, here's how I would handle that. Here's how a framework that is a good spiritual framework to plug into to help you get where you're going. That's more along the chaplain side. The coaching side is I'm helping them do that self-discovery, putting the mirror on them and helping them take their own journey of formation apart from me applying principles of spiritual formation in that context, unless I'm invited to do so. And then I say, okay, well, right now I'm gonna put my chaplain hat on and let's talk spiritual formation for a minute or the spiritual healing or that internalization process that I mentioned earlier. I've been reflecting a lot before our conversation today. And yeah, I do think that when we were in the course together, in the cohort together, you talk TCE, technical, cognitive, and emotional. And I that probably resonated with me more than anything else. And I think I mentioned head, heart, hand alignment while in our coursework. Well, I've really just chewed hard on that one. And the more I reflect on it, the more I see that that's where the real meat of life takes place. We have our sense of purpose and meaning being fruitfully expressed through all of our cognitive ability. You know, it's like I'm able to finally thrive in life. And I think there's often a disconnect between our head, our heart, and our hands and how we're getting after life. And I think as a chaplain, I help people get into that role and even as a coach, I help them get into that head heart hand alignment. Uh, although it may be a little bit different and nuanced, but I think that's where the freedom takes place. I was coaching um, a young airman today and she got excited when she heard the concept because we've been doing a lot of self-reflecting type stuff, you know, really getting her to get into herself. She's like, okay, well, I feel like I need to do something now. I said, okay, now we're ready for some hand work, head heart hands. 
and we began to move into that, into the domain of, well, what is really in my heart, right? The way I look at it is the emotions or information that tells me how I'm experiencing a situation, right? And so helping her get to that head heart hand alignment, at least get a framework for that has been very meaningful. I want to just pull that out because in the coaching course that it really stood out to me and I've been using it ever since in my own personal life and in, in other people's lives as a coach to help them have a good framework. Yeah. So I, I work with technology a lot and, and I see things, these patterns forming where like people kind of, sometimes you take that emotional and that cognitive and you apply it to the technical and you start to attach your ego to like, oh, this technical solution means, you know, that I'm like more proficient and, you know, I'm a valuable person. <laughs> Do you see like any of that in, in your line of work where maybe the ego get, gets mixed in with the technical work or, or any examples of that? That's interesting. I think when we're producing what we're capable of, we, we tend to be proud of that. And as we should be, you know, and I think it's very fulfilling. And I wonder if along the way, as I become proficient with a particular whatever it is in life that I'm becoming proficient in, that technical aspect, there also must be the emotional growth that goes with that. Or we can become a bit, you know, arrogant, cocky, that kind of thing. And and that becomes a turnoff. And then people will help us realize that we're becoming that way, you know. And so hopefully there's a constant refinement going on with us as we become more proficient in our craft. You know, I mean, what if you become an expert? Like the world looks to you now. Certainly there's some room for being proud of that. If we get too egocentric in it, we can miss the point that it's to give it rather than to receive our hearts can become disconnected from what our hands are doing or the right reasons for it. And it can cause some dissonance inside and in our relationships if we're not careful. I like how you um, kind of like flipped what I was saying about ego. Like it's it's about pride. You know, it's like there's a positive silver lining behind that attitude. So I appreciate that. And I think, you know, this podcast deals with organizations and we should want our people proud of their work. And I, I think if people aren't proud of their work, why are they there? Go do something else. I can't bring all of me into this organization. Why am I even here? I am limited by being here. I heard you say a few minutes ago, six or eight years ago, one of the things we like to do, and I know as coaches, we look forward and grow, but I think it's a worthwhile exercise to look mm -hmm. back at ourselves five years ago and say, if I knew what I knew now, what would I tell myself? So I'll ask you that question. What advice would you give to yourself five years ago? You are going to do great things. Just keep going. Be mindful of your limited beliefs. They're holding you back. And the slice of the pie that you're going to eat is going to be a large one. So keep going. People need you. And coming from me, that would be very impactful because it's me. So uh, how would you communicate across those different generations? What would you tell a millennial? How would you answer that question for Lucas? Yeah. In the St. Pierre Alliance with the scholarships and coaching, we deal with college kids. And so we're in that space. In my military role, I was at the Defense Language Institute for three years before I moved to this duty station. So I had all 18, 19, 20-year-olds, thousands of them. And here's what I see from them. I think this would be good for anybody who is employing or working with young millennials. They want to matter. And... The like button that defines their generation or the subscribe button or whatever the button is for that particular app really needs to be replaced with a person rather than the button to say, I like you, you matter here. We want, let us develop you and invest in you. And it meets that need. Why am I alive? Answering the deep question of why am I here? I think our young millennials, as a matter of fact, I, being with my background, I'm fairly confident of this. They've missed out on people giving them the deeper conversations of life. Who am I? Why am I alive? What happens when I die? What's the purpose in all of this? And I found when, when I was you know, serving at the Defense Language Institute, they craved what I had to say. They, they, uh, we want more. Come to our formations. Drop, I call them spiritual truth bombs. You know, I was just being funny. And they loved it, but they craved it. They really want someone to come in and show them that, you ready? 
you can actually be married for 20 years. It's actually doable. That love really does exist. That I am really valuable. That I actually have value and I matter. And there's this longing to hear that and be affirmed. And, the, and if we can meet that need, we can really change a life in that millennial generation. And as long as we do it with good character and with practice what you preach kind of thing, that's how I think we can serve our millennials well, more than just the task of the job that they have to do. Because they're very smart. They can do the task. But if you want to retain them, you have to go deeper than the task. It's about the person. And I think that's why the, the Department of Defense has moved to this whole coaching culture initiative. Because, you know, I work with the, you know, I don't know how old she is, probably 20, 21, different ball game than when I was coming up in the service. Different mindset, different heart set. And we have to be intentional and we have to get to know how to serve that person and that, that different worldview intentionally. You can't just passively go for it. You have to be intentional. Yeah, I like what you said about that perspective of like spirituality where, you know, a lot of people in my peers, my generation um, kind of have rejected, you know, the previous generation's religion and, you know, decided, oh, I can figure this out on my own. And I feel that, yeah, we kind of have this feeling that we need it, but we don't know where to get it from, you know. So it's not so much a pitch, it's an attraction because they see it. What is that about you? And Luca, you're, you're a millennial then, I guess, in your 20s. You look fairly young. Just 30, th almost 31. <laughs> 31. You look good for your age. You did, you're doing all right. Keep eating what you're eating, I guess. But um, it's the attraction because they do want it. But what they don't want is something that's meaningless. Like a lot of young millennials see spirituality as a set of rules that they have to follow. Like, why do I have to do that? It makes no sense to me. Or they look at some of the scandals that go on in religious denominations or, you know, people doing things that are unacceptable and they go, well, I'm not going to be a part of that. I want to be a part of something, but it won't be that. And you're right. It is a rejection, but then it's like, well, where do I find it? And that's a great question. I'd love to put it right back on you. Where do you find it? You have to take that journey for yourself. I can't do it for you. No one can. But if you want what I've got, I'll tell you how I got it. And if you want the fruit of what I got, I'll tell you how I got that too. But it's not a sales pitch as it is. It's an attraction. They go, you know, I, I just really identify with you. And a lot of them would come to me. I'm, I'm serious. They're like, I want to know what you got. And I think if we live a life that's inspiring, they will come to ask. And, and also, Lucas, if you don't mind, I was doing a briefing one time and I was teaching like worldviews and spiritual formation, how things shape. I was just going off doing my chaplain thing was great. Not so much religious. For our folks out there who don't know, I don't have to get into religion specific to teach people how we're shaped spiritually and how events shape us spiritually. That's just, that's just a different conversation. Although they can intersect, they don't, I don't have to bend in one direction on it. But when I was done talking, he, he's a sharp guy. Oh my, this guy is going to do very well in the Air Force. He stood up and he said, you know, I feel like somebody should have told us this a long time ago. I said, that's why I'm here. Because the Air Force wants you fit to fight and you have to deal with the deeper things of life if you're going to fight the fight of life. If we don't go deep into the who am I and why am I alive conversation, good luck fighting a war. What's the point in even that? Why even try to win in life, right? But when we answer the deeper questions of life, we stand tall. We have principle now. That house of leadership starts to form. Now I can see. And that's what our young millennials are looking for. They're looking for a framework that's authentic, that stands for something good and actually means what it says and doesn't just talk smack about it because they'll call cap in a heartbeat, right? Cap. Some of your audience may not know what that means. Comment below what that means, right? <laughs> it means lying, right? So anyways, that's my experience with our millennials. And they do want it. They do want it. My Lord, they want it. They really do. And they're searching. They are searching for it. I love what you're saying. You know, Lucas is the younger generation of the millennials. It's Gen Z's up now are entering the workforce. And one of the areas that I'm really looking hard at, you talked about the house of leadership that we build in our training, we talked about principles, work, family, self, taking care of self, taking care of family, 
One of the areas I'm really interested in is the great resignation and quiet quitting. I'm just beginning to think about this, so you certainly can help me. We've lost sight of the nobility of work and the amazing things that we can create for ourselves, for our families, through our work. And I'm not yet able to articulate really what I'm beginning to think about, but you know, this idea that when we die, nobody says, I wish I'd worked harder. Well, you know what? I think there are a group of people out there that will say that. If they're dragging their self out of intergenerational poverty, or they're an immigrant and they're coming here to America or anywhere where they might go and starting with nothing and creating something for their family. And so the closest I can capture it is this far into my own internal and external dialogue is there is nobility in work for the right reasons. And I'll just toss that grenade into your room and, and see what you can do with it. Well, I think the question is not so much work, but is the work meaningful? When work is meaningful, we'll assume the responsibility for it. There's this concept that I like to talk about called soul, S-O-U-L, soul responsibility. That means I own my actions. It means I own my space around me. It means I take ownership. I'm not forced to take ownership. I willingly, soul autonomy, another word there, soul autonomy. I choose, I want soul autonomy to assume responsibility for my behavior, my actions, and things that I can control, or at least try to influence soul responsibility. When we are engaging in activity that fills our cup, we can work a whole lot more and produce a whole lot more than if it's draining our cup. And I think that this goes back to the meaning conversation that we were talking about earlier. Our young millennials, the struggle to work to create something meaningful is beautiful. And the soul is meant to do that, by the way. We're meant to work. It's why I have energy. It's why I get up and do something. You know, work is what? Work equals force times distance. Thank you. When, when we're willing to put in the force and to the distance, what will determine how much force and how much distance is how much meaning we're having in the experience of doing the work. And if we get to the place where we're not willing to put in work to meaningful activity, the soul will start to die. The soul will get depressed. We'll need medication. We'll need drugs. We'll need sex. We'll need more likes. We will medicate the pain that we have. But when we work, even physical exercise is a good example. Just physically working out improves our life. Everything about our bodies, our mental state, our spiritual state, because we worked. And when we fall in love with the journey, the work becomes easy. It's not a burden. I can't wait to do more. They have to tell me to stop right? I need to now have a balance of work life as we like to call it, right? So th I think the question is how meaningful is the activity? And for our millennials out there and our Gen Zers, because, you know, thanks for bifurcating those out because I did have a bunch of Gen Zers, you know, 19, 20, 18 year olds, that's Gen Z. They're very smart people, very intellectual, very capable and competent. Put something in front of them that's meaningful and give them space. I remember I read in a book, uh, Stephen Kotler, uh, The Art of Impossible. He talked about, I think it's 20% time or 15% time. I can't remember. Google gave, that's a lot of money to give 20% of people in Google. I don't know how many employees they have and what they pay, but their payroll ain't cheap. And uh, they gave 20% of their time. But look what we got. Google Maps, Google, I, I got to go back and look. All of these apps that I'm using every day came from that. And productivity just skyrocketed. Why? Because we physically become empowered, like chemically. We start firing off when we get into the flow, that flow psychology concept, right? We get into the flow. We lose focus on time. What is time? I don't even know what time it is anymore because I was so getting after it. That's because the activity is meaningful. So when the work is equal to force times distance, right? Force times distance, that was it. When the outcome of that, when the formula throws in purpose behind it and put that as a multiplier, force times distance times purpose, now you're a force to be, that's unstoppable. 
Think of the people running for president. That's just a treacherous journey to go through the the way you're treated, your family, the, everything that happens with the media and the people don't like you, your popularity is down and they badmouth you and the comics come on at 9.30 and 10 o'clock at night and poke at you and, and then all the pressure you're under. Surely you didn't just decide to get a job as president and hope you get the, you know, put in your application. There's something in the purpose part of the equation of work that's the multiplier to get you to the end goal. Yeah, I love that. And Lucas, if you'd allow me to follow up, and I agree with everything you said, I think, and I love adding P onto the W equals F times D times P. Now, I love that. I think the miscommunication to the younger generations is the purpose and attractiveness of the task or the outcome. Because the purpose for me is in the outcome. Now, I'll give you examples from my own life. Shoveling manure as a dairy farmer. I'm never going to enjoy that ever. But what is it doing? It's contributing to the purpose, the sustainment of the family. And so therefore, my purpose is there. Falling asleep in a mud puddle, waiting for an ambush to start in training. Am I ever going to enjoy that? Never. But I knew it was serving a higher purpose. Going to college, if you think, or a vocational school, if you think that's your path. That path is a challenging path but it's contributing to a greater purpose. So I think we're confusing perhaps in our communication to the younger generations, the task associated with the purpose. Yeah, I was actually thinking that when, when Jerry was speaking on that, like, yeah, like I think a lot of the times it's like, oh, I want, I want to have a job that has purpose. So you look at like particular fields or particular, you know, industries. But I think what JR is saying, and I kind of agree, like you can kind of find that in every industry if you're working with people and, you know, making connections. And well, and I also think I don't have to have a job and doing certain tasks that contributes to their purpose. It could help me get where my purpose is in life. In other words, it's an equitable relationship. I'm making good money here so I can turn around and, and be investing and, and create a, a future that I want for myself. That's like when I went to college, it was the end goal of what I wanted to do, right? And so, you know, especially I think for folks in their younger age of life, the younger years, I think we get a job for money. It didn't really cross our mind, like, what's the purpose of this? We get a job for money. And what do we do with that money? Well, hopefully we're taking the journey to say, what is meaningful to me? And then I go give greatness to this organization because the organization is enabling me to get where I want to be in life. And I might not be with the organization for 30 years. That's not common these days. Might be for five. But it's like this uh, host type relationship where we're both benefiting from our relationship together. You're benefiting from the skills that I bring to you and I produce something great for you and you, you give me financially and other things that, you know, the quality of life of the company. And it's helping me get where I want to be in life. You know, it's like everybody wants to retire so they can finally start living. Well, what if I could start living today? Right. I mean, you hear that, you know, but for me, I like to think I'm, I joke, I'm, I'm going to tell you this. I tell my wife, I want to hold a retirement ceremony. I've been telling her I really want to do that because I don't feel like I, I work like a job that I have to do. You know, I do what I want to do all day. And it just so happens I'm in the Air Force and I'm enjoying that. And it's good for me. But I created this space for me. Over all the things that I've done has created this space for me. Even things that I didn't want to take algebra. Although I do use percentages now and ratios. I have to say, I actually use ratios a lot because I want to see how much money I'm making, right? <laughs> or do we need to cut things here? You know, I'm starting to use a little bit at algebra. And maybe a little bit of biology when I want to talk about my diet, you know, but some of the stuff that, you know, all the work that I did, it was to open a door for me. And so I, I made good grades. It's the same thing, I think, with a good job. You're getting paid good. You're getting where you want to be. The company takes care of you. And I might not care about their bottom line because I'm looking out for mine at this phase of my life, but because it's a mutual relationship, I'll help you get where you want to go because you help me get where I want to go. And hopefully we get to the place in life where I've arrived to a place where now I give my time to helping others and, 
you know, that kind of thing. So I'm looking at the clock and uh, out of respect for everyone's time. It's our tradition. Lucas gets to ask the final question. So toss to you, Lucas. So you mentioned being kind of like that feeling of being lost and you're kind of trying, like you're grasping at things. Um, But a lot of the times, yeah, you said like, I'm not even sure. I'm not sure I'm lost. What, What questions do you ask yourself to kind of like gauge? Like, do I need to reach out for help? Do I need to explore this further? Well, definitely if you wake up in the morning and go, what's the point? You probably need to talk to somebody. If you go into work and you go, I hate this, you probably need to talk about this with somebody who can help you think, a good coach, for example, who could help you dig inside and go, what do you want? That soul autonomy, what do you want? But if if you wake up and go, you know what? I'm excited about this. I might not be excited about this right now, but I know where it's going to get me. Now that, that can be healthy because now I have meaning and purpose in the the task because where it's going to make me be. If I wake up angry or sad or feeling disappointed, when we feel those negative emotions like that, that's because there's a need that's not being met somewhere. And it's important to go find that need. And it's not bad to feel those ways, by the way. It's okay to be sad, to feel insecure, to feel not good enough. That is the human condition. It's okay to feel that way but it's what you do with it. What is the information that you need to find behind that emotion? And once you find that information, what's lacking in your heart, your soul, your life, you can then backtrack to say, okay, what is the opposite of that? And what would that look like? And now you have a direction to go to. And so check your emotions, check how you experience your day to day. If it's not making you on fire, if it's not waking you up with excitement where you want to get after it, it's a good indicator that there's an opportunity to get with a good performance coach, a good coach who can help you do some good reflection to find out what your natural bent is and how that natural bent can be expressed in the world so that you kind of can't wait to do it. That's beautiful. Yeah, that goes back to that emotional intelligence and, you know, being able to cognitively like look at yourself from outside yourself. So thank you for that. Well, that concludes this episode of Building a Coaching Culture. I truly hope that this episode was helpful to you. If it was, be sure to follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. Maybe stop and give us a rating or a review and share this podcast with someone who might find it helpful as well. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.